Two uses of purpose in statutory interpretation. Mark P. Mancini author notes, Statute Law Review, Volume 45, Issue 2, August 2024, published the 29th of August 2024, Abstract. Despite apparent agreement on the approach to the interpretation of statutes in Canada, a system of limited parliamentary sovereignty, judges differ on a fundamental point, how purpose is used in interpretation. Some judges craft arguments that view the text as the medium through which the legislature expresses its intention, using purpose to shed light on the meaning of the text in defined ways, text as medium interpretation. Others see the background purposes or values of the statutory context as binding constraints in a coherent legal order, with text as merely a signal to meaning, purpose as medium interpretation. This paper argues that text as medium interpretation offers the most persuasive account of the use of purpose in interpretation, especially in a system of legislative sovereignty, which constrains interpretive choice. By bringing to light the commitments of these two interpretive arguments in the Canadian context for the first time, the paper also raises deeper normative questions about how to view legislation in a Westminster parliamentary democracy. These questions are fundamental to the relationship between sovereign legislatures and courts. Issues section, article. In Canada, the Supreme Court's commitment to the use of purpose in interpretation is apparently settled. Courts interpreting statutes must always consider the text, context, and purpose of a provision in the ultimate search for legislative intent. One despite this clear instruction, the Supreme Court admits that. C. On fusion as to what this might entail in practice endures, too in part. This may be because the Supreme Court's interpretive method reflects a pragmatic bias. 3. It does not instruct courts how to resolve disputes when interpretive guides pull in different directions. 4. While this pragmatism is sometimes cast as an innate feature of interpretation. 5. The accompanying lack of methodological precision can catalyze fundamental differences between judges on the use of various tools of interpretation. Though the object of interpretation remains the intent of the legislature promulgated as a statute, judges sometimes differ, in fundamentally incompatible ways, on what the best medium, or mode of communication, of that intent might be. Six the positions can be mapped on a spectrum with different judges placing themselves on various points along the way. On one side of the spectrum, the approach expressed by Court AJ and Media QNI sees the ordinary meaning of the text, promulgated by the sovereign legislature, as the primary medium of the legislature's meaning. She says that courts do not have to interpret, let alone implement, the objective underlying a legislative scheme or provision. What they must interpret is the text through which the legislature seeks to achieve that objective. 7. This method takes the text as the medium through which legislative intent is communicated but uses purpose, the principle or basic idea of the statute 8 to guide interpretation and shed light on broad statutory terms. 9. On the other side of the spectrum. Judges of the Supreme Court have indicated a preference for a method that takes purpose as the best evidence of legislative intent, the medium that conveys that intention. 10. This method warrants that the purpose of legal provisions, scope to align with broader principles of the legal order, should be worked out and implemented by courts, even where the precise and ordinary meaning of a statutory term might prevent this implementation. 11 judges applying this method tend to view the text as only a starting point for legal reasoning, raw material that can be stretched or compressed, supplemented, or overridden. 12 both views prescribe different methodological outcomes, and both rest on deeper normative views of the legislative process. While this divergence is still developing in the cases, I argue that text as medium interpretation provides a more complete account of the role of purpose especially considering the constitutional rule of recognition of parliamentary sovereignty. 13 text as medium interpretation recognizes that legislative choice, represented in a statute, is multi-layered. It appreciates that close attention to statutory text reveals structural means, rules, standards, statutory recipes or broad, ambulatory grants of authority that demonstrate how a legislature wishes to achieve its purposes, 14. The Supreme Court has referred to these choices as institutional design choices. 15. In an attempt to better cohere statutes with its abstract purposes or values of the legal order, 
purposes medium interpretation may fail to give adequate weight to these second order institutional design choices because of a counterfactual assumption of legislative intent, an assumption that legislatures must be understood to have taken account of certain background values when promulgating a particular statute. 16. The paper proceeds as follows. Part I is expository in nature, outlining the Canadian method of interpretation and the normative assumptions underpinning these different uses of purpose, considering the background principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Part two then makes the normative argument, expanding on the claims related to the multi-layered nature of legislative choice and the weakness of the counterfactual strategy. Throughout, I rely on cases from Canadian courts that diverge on the proper medium that best expresses the legislature's intent. 1. Part 1. A. The Canadian Law of Statutory Interpretation and Methodological Choice. The Canadian Law of Statutory Interpretation is nested within a system of parliamentary sovereignty, and so any account of the use of purpose in interpretation must grapple with this fundamental legal fact. Traditionally, parliamentary sovereignty provides that the legislature has the exclusive authority to enact, amend, and repeal any laws it sees fit, and there is no matter in respect of which it may not make laws 17 this principle, a foundational principle of the Westminster model of government, 18 rejects external legal limitation on legislative authority imposed by courts, outside of constitutional limits. It also supplies the source of power that nourishes a legislature when it promulgates a statute. For interpretation, this means that, t, the object of interpretation is the statute actually enacted, not some other statute that members of parliament may have mistakenly believed they were enacting 19 more is the object of interpretation another, perpetrated source of law. This remains presumptively true in Canada, subject to the limitations of the division of powers provided by the Constitution Act, 1867 and the adoption of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms within the Constitution Act, 1982. These limitations significantly alter the traditional Westminster parliamentary landscape, but even so, parliamentary sovereignty remains foundational to the structure of the Canadian state, and the legislative branch of government remains supreme over both the judiciary and the executive. 20. Importantly, this understanding of parliamentary sovereignty coexists with a model of constitutional supremacy within the boundaries laid out by the division of powers and the charter. Legislatures are sovereign, outside of those boundaries, legislatures cannot go. Statutory interpretation involves the determination of the meaning of legislation where that legislation is presumptively constitutionally valid. This description suggests that parliamentary sovereignty acts as a persuasive guide to the way courts should interact with statutes. 21. The law of interpretation should plausibly aim to respect and facilitate the exercise of legislative authority, rather than to frustrate and usurp it. 22. In service of this aim, the Canadian law of interpretation commits itself to finding legislative intent. 23. In this search for legislative intent, Canada's law of interpretation seems well settled, described in the Rizzo case. Today there is only one principle or approach, namely, the words of an act are to be read in their entire context, and in their grammatical and ordinary sense harmoniously with the scheme of the act, the object of the act, and the intention of Parliament. 24. The Rizzo approach is understood to distill the tools of interpretation to a single mantra, text, context, and purpose. 25. This unified approach is designed to overcome and incorporate the elder, well-worn approaches of interpretation, the little approach, the golden rule, and the mischief rule, 26 but despite these settled methodological commitments, the Supreme Court has never fleshed out the normative purchase of legislative intent, beyond the assertion that the search for it is guided by the words that Parliament has chosen to use, the way it intended to achieve its objectives, and the scheme it has put in place. 27 legislative intent, the Court has asserted can be understood only by reading the language chosen by the legislature in light of the purpose of the provision, and the entire relevant context 28 putting this account in its best light. Legislative intent appears to be a kind of fiction, a constructive intention to be gathered from the wording 29 the application of the tools of interpretation, text, context and purpose, will lead to a result that an interpreting court can justifiably ascribe to the enacting legislature, 30. The Canadian view thus has surprising connections to textualist thought.
which accepts that intent, to the extent it exists, is a function of the intent that a reasonable person would gather from the text of the law, placed alongside the remainder of the corpus juris. 31 indeed, this approach, which characterizes legislative intent as represented by the language of the enactment, is well worn in British and Canadian law. 32. Understood this way, legislative intent serves at least two functions. First, legislative intent establishes a temporal restraint on interpretation. 33. The temporal restraint provides that a statute should be interpreted according to its original meaning, because it is this statute, and not some other source of law, that has been promulgated by the sovereign legislature at a particular point in time. 34. This does not necessarily freeze meaning in time. Sometimes, legislative text is broad and qualitative, suggesting a dynamic approach that applies in new circumstances. 35. This, as we shall see, is itself a deliberate legislative choice to design an ambulatory statute. Importantly, whatever the status of the Canadian Constitution as a living tree, 36. The original meaning principle is well accepted in the realm of statutory interpretation. 37. It operates by framing the ordinary meaning of the text as a control over dynamic interpretation, favoring such interpretations where the text is broad and ambulatory. Similarly, the formal restraint establishes that legislative intent is not represented in a photograph or some other medium of communication. It is represented in a text promulgated under certain circumstances for certain purposes. It is the product of the institutional give and take of a particular jurisdiction's accepted procedures for adopting binding law. In Canada's case, a binding text promulgated by a sovereign legislature. These restraints can roughly justify and organize multiple methods of interpretation, but they provide a set of evaluative standards that, alongside others, provide legitimate bases on which to judge the application of the Rizzo methodology in particular cases. In tension with this view, is a well-acknowledged perspective in Canada on interpretation that assigns no inherent weight in the abstract to constraints on interpretation, and would therefore be cautious about the existence or extent of constraint deduced from the principle of legislative sovereignty. While this position is ironically itself an abstract statement about what interpretation is, 38 it is nonetheless one plausible understanding of Rizzo, 39. Pragmatism suggests that each judge takes advantage of the full range of interpretive resources available to interpreters, and deploys those resources appropriately given the particulars of the case. 40. There are grains of truth in the pragmatist view. As Duxbury demonstrates, L. Legislative intention does not control statutory interpretation. 41. Duxbury puts the problem squarely. The inability of constitutional principles to completely dictate interpretive choice, determining the meaning of a legislative text, will be a matter of methodological choice that is constrained, but not completely directed by, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Logically, that the promulgated text, the putative object of interpretation, is a product of intentional action does not settle how best to establish that intention. 42. This being so, Parliamentary sovereignty, and its accompanying restraints, can offer probative standards for evaluating particular interpretive moves in specific cases. 43. As Richard Eakins argues, responding to the view that there is nothing that interpretation just is, a law, making act promulgated in a particular way implies that only some modes of reasoning recognize the Constitution's nature and aim to understand its content accordingly. 44. Put in terms of statutory interpretation, a legislative act, promulgated as a text by a lawmaker with constitutionally ordained power, must be interpreted according to the nature of the instrument, and its place in a certain constitutional framework, to that point. It is true that Canada's legal system is now best described as a system of constitutional supremacy, rather than pure parliamentary sovereignty. 45. This could also impact the way interpretation should be conducted, however, the basic fact of parliamentary sovereignty remains at the center of Canada's political institutions, absent constitutional objection. 46. For this reason, certain rules of interpretation that call for coherence between written texts and background legal norms remain important, but they take a distinctly secondary status to an ordinary interpretation of a text. 47. This subordination, as we will see, 
itself reflects an interpretive choice that prioritizes the product of an exercise of sovereignty, the statutory text, a judge operating in this fashion, must limit herself to interpretive principles, that find some convincing link to the background principle of parliamentary sovereignty, and its accompanying restraints. Methodology must imply authenticity or some degree of objectivity, so that a particular interpretation can be measured against a set of norms that transcend the particular vantage point of the person offering the interpretation. 48. These norms, which Owen Fisk calls disciplining rules, serve to constrain the interpreter and constitute the standards by which the correctness of the interpretation is to be judged. 49. Importantly, this idea of an objective interpretation does not demand that the interpretation be wholly determined by some source external to the judge, but only that it be constrained. 50. In Canada, Supreme Court Judge Justice Malcolm Rowe has similarly advocated for a structured and deliberate methodology. 51. In Constitutional Interpretation this methodology operates, b, by limiting the ways in which the elements of legal reasoning can be used and combined so that certain types of justifications become unavailable. 52. Similar to FIS, Justice Rowe views constraint in interpretation as an important function of methodology. This constraint can operate in several ways. It can order and prioritize sources from which judges can legitimately draw meaning. 53. And it can define basic concepts, while setting the proper procedural circumstances under which the interpretation must occur. 54 Roe J views methodology as a constraint on judicial reasoning, such that anything goes cannot be an acceptable approach to interpretation. Following Roe J's position, and in statutory interpretation specifically, it is not untoward to suggest that an interpretive methodology, like Risto, should constrain interpretation in this way. Nor is it unjustifiable to suggest that parliamentary sovereignty, and deductions from that principle, should inform interpretive choice. There are many choices faced by a judge under the Rizzo approach. For example, does parliamentary sovereignty imply certain assumptions about the sources from which courts can draw inferences of legislative intent? More to our point, does an understanding of the legislature as a lawmaking body affect how courts might use statutory purposes in interpreting statutory text? B2 uses of purpose. This sets up the methodological divergence in the Canadian cases, creating two general positions that could both plausibly aim at establishing legislative intent, but which presuppose different understandings of the Rizzo approach in its characterization of statutory purpose. The divergence is probably best described as a shading or a spectrum, with judges mixing and matching commitments from each side of the split. The divergence, such as it is, does not and cannot explain interpretive results in isolation. Judges often rely on array of interpretive resources. However, the divergence is methodologically important because it suggests a fundamental difference in the starting premise of interpretation in relation to the background principle of parliamentary sovereignty. On one hand, text as medium interpretation reads the text in its ordinary and contextual meaning. As the best evidence of legislative intention, as the medium through which legislative intent is communicated, 55, those who take the text as the proper medium generally reject calls for its ordinary meaning to be overcome considering a claimed statutory purpose, 56 those in this interpretive mold interpret the text broadly, it includes not only the language of the statute in its ordinary meaning, but its structure and context, put alongside reasons for action. 57 consistent with this account is a particular method for sourcing purpose. Purpose is often established by simply by reading the words of the legislation. 58 drawing elementary deductions from the structure of the statute to infer what the legislation was designed to accomplish. 59 taking the text as the proper medium of legislative meaning is a significant methodological choice, not least because it prescribes a subordinate but important role for purpose in statutory interpretation. Purpose guides interpretation in that the goals, purposes, concerns of the authors illuminate things. 60 Canadian courts have used purpose in just this way. First, in cases of broad statutory language, the mischief or aim that motivated the legislative act might help to shed light on which of two dueling interpretations, each plausibly justified by the text, should be adopted. 61 in this way. Purpose rationalizes a stopping point that helps to identify the most probable meaning of the broad statutory term. 62 in theory, 
This use of purpose respects the broad meaning of the text, merely specifying a plausible definition of it, or confirming that the semantic breadth of the ordinary meaning should be respected. 63. Note that this is quite different from a situation where a claimed purpose is used to modify the narrow, ordinary meaning of a particular text in order to better promote a stated purpose. An approach that views text as the proper medium of legislative intention rejects this use of purpose. Second, purpose serves as a confirmatory heuristic, a check to prevent against literalistic interpretation. This function of purpose can be explained by the Supreme Court's insistence that purpose must be consulted by courts in every case, no matter how clear the text might appear, because of t the possibility of the context revealing a latent ambiguity. 64. There is good reason to ensure that there is at least a rational connection between the first impression interpretation of the text and a chosen purpose. 65. This is a doctrinal nod to the reality that language can underdetermine mean intended meaning. 66. Moving down to the other end of the spectrum, purpose plays a more significant role in this mold. Canadian judges sometimes see the purpose of a statutory provision, or the broader law as the legal norm that must be understood and implemented, 67 here, rather than acting as a soft constraint. A statement of animating purpose serves as the medium of legislative intent, against which any interpretation must be measured, armed with a concern for statutory literalism, 68, those who take purposes to best reflect the meaning of the legislature seek to achieve an interpretation that is generally just and reasonable in the context of a particular legal order, especially in situations where a statute's semantic detail produces an outcome that appears unreasonable in light of the law's background purpose. 69 Turning around Court AJ's statement in Media QMI, and on this view, the interpretation and implementation of legislative purposes is the best way to effectuate the intention of the legislature. The selection of and wait to sign two background purposes is largely a matter of interpretive choice. Interpreters deploying this method can select purposes from different levels of abstraction, ranging from a norm that is clearly expressed in statutory text to ones that extend to certain kinds of legislation, such as pro-benefits legislation, said to require liberal interpretation, 70, to a broader category described by Aharon Barak, as the fundamental values of the system which constitute the general objective purpose shared by all legislation. 71. Additionally, judges who see the purpose of a provision as the legal norm that it must interpret and implement will rely on purpose statements, legislative history, and other sources of meaning. Put this way, the aim of scoping and understanding purpose is an integral step in interpretation. It assists the interpreter in placing the legislative act on the spectrum of coherence, aligning it with any relevant that purportedly claim the force of law. Examples from the cases flesh out these competing views of the proper medium and the spectrum on which they lay. Take, first, the Supreme Court's decision in Shrink, which demonstrates well the shading that characterizes the different views of the two uses of purpose. This case involved the British Columbia Human Rights Code and the scope of its prohibition against discrimination regarding employment, specifically, does the prohibition capture those external to the employer-employee relationship? The court split three ways, with a clear majority of judges finding that the prohibition extends beyond the employment relationship, capturing others in the workplace and subjecting them to potential liability under the Human Rights Code. All of the opinions are considered and thoughtful, relying on several types of interpretive arguments to reach their respective conclusions, but in different ways. Each opinion relies on a certain view of purpose, representing the purpose as medium perspective at its most extreme. A concurring opinion by Bella J. considered the meaning of employment discrimination in a way that is consistent with, and emerges from, our well-settled human rights principles, and not just the particular words of British Columbia's Code. 72 for her, these principles were designed to protect employees from indignity of discriminatory conduct verbal or otherwise, in a workplace 73, t, technical lines of authority that give priority to the text may end up defeating these goals. 74, this perspective views the Human Rights Code as enacting a cluster of general human rights principles, and these principles form the intent of the legislature that must be respected by courts. Further down the spectrum, a majority opinion, written by Roe J., 
chastise the concurring opinion for rejecting the text. 75 for him, comma. Our starting point remains the words adopted by the British Columbia legislature when defining the scope of discrimination regarding employment specifically. 76, however, Rose J relies on the purpose statements included in the law designed to foster a society in British Columbia in which there are no impediments to full and free participation in the economic, social, political and cultural life of British Columbia. 77 Rose J was convinced that, in this case, these purpose statements were broadly representative of the legislature's intention, demonstrated through the enacted text, which enshrined a rule that nothing in the stated purposes of the code suggests limiting the application of Section 13, 1, B, to formal employment relationships, or to those analogous to employment by virtue of the economic control and dependency between the parties. 78 This view is somewhat of a middle ground on the spectrum driven in part by the specific legislative choice to enact a broad purpose statement, while Roger relied on several indicia of legislative meaning in his comprehensive opinion. He takes the purpose statement as disclosing a concise statement of the legislation, against which interpretations of the text can be measured, hence the conclusion that this statement compels a broad reading of regarding employment, for Roger. The term regarding employment should be read so as better to achieve the goals of the provision enacted in the purpose statement. 79A reading of the term that limited its ambit to the employee-employer relationship would be necessarily premised on a narrow view of how power is exercised in the workplace. 80 failing to recognize that. T. He exploitation of identity hierarchies to perpetrate discrimination against marginalized groups can be just as harmful to an employee as economic subordination. 81. These hierarchies, and other social considerations, were reflected in the Code's purpose statement that refers to cultural life. 82. Roger's view deploys a strand of a purpose as medium approach, while nonetheless giving credence to the text. Closer to the text as medium position, and in a dissenting opinion, McLaughlin C.J. for three judges took a different approach. She agreed that while H., Human rights legislation should be interpreted broadly in order to facilitate the public-oriented objectives of such statutes. Judges must still root the interpretation in the text of the statute. 83. Limiting the ambit of the prohibition to those who have power and responsibility over the workplace in which the complainant finds himself. 84. The term regarding employment in the provision carried a special significance limiting the ambit of the prohibition to those who all have power and responsibility over the workplace in which the complainant finds himself 85 here. McLaughlin C.J. takes the ordinary meaning of the text as setting the frame of analysis. She notes that if the broad approach favored by Roe J. and Abella J. best reflected the intention of the legislature, it would have used the term workplace to denote broad coverage rather than employment, which relates to a central case of an employee-employer relationship 86. This textual reading views the semantic meaning of regarding employment as foreclosing certain interpretive moves, rather than viewing the purpose statement as commanding a certain reading of the term. McLaughlin C.J. shows how this fixed semantic meaning connects to the broad purposes of the B.C. Human Rights Code. While the Human Rights Code's operative purposes are expansive, the text trains its regulatory guns on those responsible for intervening and halting the events in question 87. In other words, the semantic meaning of the term regarding employment, read ordinarily, imposes burdens on employers in order to achieve the goals of the statute. Measured against the scheme established by the legislation, a division of responsibility between employers and all others, this view takes the ordinary meaning of the term employment, but asks whether and how it connects to any relevant purposes of the provision. Schrenk illustrates the different uses of purpose, which appear to different extents and in combination with different arguments. This same divergence is also evident in the Court of Appeal for Ontario's decision in Walsh. At issue in Walsh was section 162.1, 1, and 2, of the Criminal Code. Section 162.1, 1, in short, makes it an offence for a person to knowingly disseminate an intimate image of a person without their consent. 88. An intimate image is defined by section 162.1.2 and relates to a visual recording of a person made by any means including a photographic, film or video recording. 
The issue is whether a FaceTime call that displays explicit content could constitute a recording for the purposes of section 162.1.2. Strictly speaking, FaceTime video calls cannot be conventionally saved and reproduced, like a photo. Nonetheless, for a majority, Jalees J.A. concluded that the FaceTime call was captured by the provision, accepting the Crown's arguments. The Crown, at trial, argued that the language of the provisions must be read in the context of the harm that section 162.1 was enacted to address sexual exploitation committed through technology including cyberbullying and revenge porn 89 Jalees J.A. held that the ordinary meaning of the term recording did not require that the intimate image be reproduced. 90 while she admits that in times gone by, the word recording may have been confined to visuals that could be reproduced and viewed at a later time or place. The historical weight of the term could not stand against the tide of new technology. 91 a definition requiring reproducibility would fail to respond to the ways in which modern technology permits sexual exploitation through the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. In so doing, it would undermine the objects of section 162.1 and the intention of Parliament in enacting it. 92. Miller J. A. dissented, concluding that the term recording carried significance, and rejecting the majority's approach as contradictory of basic principles of statutory interpretation 93 rather than beginning with the abstract purpose at which the statute was directed. Miller J.A. took the ordinary meaning of the text as the central medium by which the legislature communicated its instruction. 94 that ordinary meaning, for Miller J.A., quite clearly eliminated a definition of recording that tied it to any visual display created by any means. 95 for him, recording implies reproducibility. He was unable to find any evidence that the term was used in a broader manner. 96 indeed, FaceTime as a phenomenon was known before the enactment of the provision, and live video transmission existed long before FaceTime. Parliament is taken to be aware of these developments. 97 in rejecting the Crown's arguments, Miller J.A. noted that, T. The interpretive question is not what best promotes the section's purpose, such that courts can modify the text to best bring about that result, but rather how Parliament chose to promote its purpose. 98. Finding a connection between the narrower definition of recording and the purposes of the provision, Miller J.A. notes that he is careful not to conflate purpose and meaning, ensuring that the text plays a central role in the analysis. 99. It is tempting to suggest, in both Schrenk and Walsh, that any of the approaches adopted in the cases are consistent with Rizzo. All of them could be said to pay attention to the text at some level. Nonetheless, if Rizzo is to offer a structured and deliberate methodology, there must be some internal mechanism through which to determine whether interpretations best reflect the method. And in these cases, there are differences in the weight assigned to various potential mediums of legislative intention. In Schrenk, Rose J. and Abella J. rely on the text to different degrees, reflecting the divergence in medium as the spectrum of positions, but both generally ask how a term, claimed to be open to various interpretations, better promotes the purposes of the provision. Rose J., for example, justifies his interpretation by suggesting that the provision is designed to capture inequities that occur in the workplace, but are not directly related to the employment relationship, traditionally understood. McLaughlin C.J., on the other hand, draws binding meaning from the term regarding employment, and then asks how that meaning connects to the purposes of the provision. This is a fine difference, but an important one. As the Supreme Court has held, the court cannot disregard the actual words chosen by Parliament and rewrite the legislation to accord with its own view of how the legislative purpose could be better promoted 100. The difference lies in how purpose is used. Is it used as the norm that courts must implement, reading the text to better capture the purported aims of the statute? Or does the court ask how the legislature's precise terms connect to statutory aims? 2. Part 2. The case for text as medium. With these two points on the spectrum of uses of purpose in mind, I turn to the normative argument. If Risto is to key itself to the background principle of parliamentary sovereignty, it requires a full account of legislative choice. I argue that text as medium interpretation, which nonetheless uses purpose to guide textual interpretation, usefully focuses on the means adopted by the legislature to achieve its goals, a reflection of the multi-
lay of nature of legislative choice in a system of parliamentary sovereignty, because purpose as medium interpretation often depends on a counterfactual assumption of legislative intent. 101. The weakness of that assumption could sever the constitutionally required connection between the judicial act of interpretation and the legislative act. Granting purpose and Nazi's rule as a methodological matter. Before turning to this argument, I first explore further differences between positions on the spectrum when it comes to the question of legal coherence, which foregrounds the following argument. With these arguments in mind, the point is to assess whether and how text as medium interpretation might better reflect legislative choice. This is in service of putting Rizzo in its best light as a structured and deliberate methodology that necessarily rules out certain interpretive moves that might sit in tension with parliamentary sovereignty. These arguments can be seen as reasons to deduce certain constraints from the principle of parliamentary sovereignty that prevent uses of purpose that violate these constraints. A differing views on coherence. Understanding the entire spectrum of the uses of purpose requires deeper reflection on the normative ideals underlying methodological choice. Most obviously, different uses of purpose can implicate the ideal of legal coherence. Much has been written about coherence, but in broad and crude strokes. It exists when a set of rules can be explained as the outworking of a single principle 102 interpretation can aim at coherence if it seeks to justify an interpretation of a particular statutory term by reference to higher order principles or values which are thought to give coherence to the set of legal rules, in this case, the rules prescribed by positive law, 103, the choice of medium to guide interpretation necessarily invites differing views about the nature and desirability of coherence. Coherence can be measured in at least two dimensions. Consider the first, the distinction between local and global coherence. As Raz argues, local coherence refers to coherence of doctrine in specific fields. 104 contrasted with global coherence imposed on the whole of the law 105, this distinction is a matter of degree. Much like the spectrum evident in Schrenk, 106, the level of generality at which courts scope purpose, is thus important for guiding the interpretation of the contester provision. As Manning explains, those who adopt purpose-driven methodologies are more likely to see the legislative act as messily drafted but coherently expressed at a level of general normative principle. 107 This means that the text cannot, as a matter of course, be relied upon. It is a premise for legal reasoning, but only that. 108 On the other hand, those who adopt the opposite approach will see statutes as deliberately drafted, but they are less likely to accept that statutory design choices reflected in the text, neatly reflect abstract value-laden normative principles. 109 This view characterizes language as shared conventions that users of the can generally understand, and so justifying a presumption of deliberate drafting. 110 While suggesting that the legislature may not coherently achieve certain normative aims, at a higher level of abstraction, for purpose as medium interpretation, the matter seems different. Rather, this view proceeds from a claim about the nature of law and the requirements that this imposes on an interpreter to align statutory text with other components of the legal order. These claims, then, turn on different views of coherence, but they also make qualitatively different claims about the nature of law and the adjudicative role. The second dimension is institutional in nature. Is coherence a function of legislative design or judicial manifestation? Barak draws a distinction in this regard between subjective purposes of the author and objective purposes of the legal order, suggesting that purposive interpretation can harmonize between these purposes. 111 But there are different views about who is responsible for setting the degree of coherence between the legislative act and various legal principles operating in the background of that act. In Barak's terms, whether the author's intentions or the objective purposes of the legal order presumably imposed by judges, should matter most. Thick conceptions of legal coherence that assign a vital role to the judiciary span the ideological spectrum. The common law is no stranger to concerns about coherence. It is an ancient maxim, endorsed by thinkers ranging from Aristotle to Blackstone, that equity, understood as epikenia, provides the correction of that where in the law, by reason of its universality, is deficient 112 at its strongest.
130 English judges in the 17th century developed the equity of the statute approach, which empowered them to quite literally correct laws that were either over or under-inclusive when measured against the sense and reason of the law. 114 While much has been written about the doctrine and its history, 115 It is well accepted that it provided a warrant for judicial amendment of statute law. 116 Whether driven by an animus towards legislation, or otherwise an abiding belief in a common law, as expression or manifestation of commonly shared values and conceptions of reasonableness, and the common good. 117 judges of this period saw the common law as a freestanding source of authority to amend statutes. 118. From a different ideological valence, purposes medium interpretation also finds common cause with the Dawkin of Law's empire, who saw the coherence of law as an essential aspect of its nature. 119. Dawkin's view also seeks global coherence imposed at the point of interpretation, with no pretense of a concept of legislative intent. 120. Dawkin articulates a concept of law as integrity, in which the coercive power of law must be rooted in a coherent set of principles on the assumption that they were all created by a single author the community personified expressing a coherent conception of justice and fairness. 121. His view tracks the two different dimensions of coherence. He seeks global coherence, imposed at the point of interpretation, with the judge acting as a cipher for the community. Those who seek coherence in the legal order are not required to commit to such a strong judicial role. Instead, interpretive methodology can link background purposes to parliamentary intention. Adopters of so-called purposive interpretation regularly attribute presumptions of coherence to the legislative act, creating a connection between that act and the judicial act of interpretation. Hart and Sachs famously referred to legislatures as composed of reasonable persons pursuing reasonable purposes reasonably. 122 which means that interpretation should proceed on the premise that the legislature has enacted the legislation to foster the public interest. 123. This position implicitly recognizes that the Dworkinian approach sits uncomfortably with parliamentary sovereignty. Even the common law itself was not always committed to such a strong judicial role. Perhaps for this reason, the equity of the statute approach was often accompanied by presumptions that the legislature does not intend to oust certain background principles of the common law. 124 In fact, common law judges frequently mixed and match the equity of the statute approach with other distinct concepts of parliamentary intention, mischief, and purpose. 125 this expository account of the differences between the two uses of purpose suggests that the choice of media makes a methodological difference, nourished by different views about the legislative process, by viewing statutory purposes and other principles of the legal order, as the medium of the legislature's intention, purposes medium interpretation can attach priority to a thick, coherent account of the nature of law, and the role of legislative institutions in contributing to that law. On the other hand, by viewing the text as relevant medium, text as medium interpretation accepts the plan adopted by the legislature, even if that scheme contains notable gaps. As a side note, there are defined circumstances in which Canadian law mandates coherence through the use of interpretive presumptions. There are several of these presumptions. 126 1, for example, provides that where possible, statutes should be interpreted to be consistent with charter values. 127 others are rooted in the idea that individuals should be secure against interference by the state with the liberty or property of the subject. 128. This includes the specific presumption that property should not be taken without compensation. 129. The use of substantive presumptions, however, is significantly limited, perhaps in recognition of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. This is so in two ways. First, they can only be invoked if the words of the provision can reasonably be interpreted in more than one way after due consideration of the context in which they appear, and the purpose of the provision 130, this sequencing suggests that substantive canons will only be used to help discern text that admits of more than one meaning after purposive analysis, which is structured and limited by the text. Not only does this likely sideline the force of substantive canons, but it means that they apply within the frame of the semantic meaning of the text.
where the purposive analysis suggests one clear meaning to the text, it must be given effect. This reflects a methodological choice influenced by the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, one which rules out certain uses of substantive presumptions of legislative intent, because substantive canons erroneously relied upon can subvert the text. They are given a particular role with a subordinate function in the law of interpretation. Second, the existence of substantive presumptions does not underwrite a general gap-filling function for courts as a matter of course in all areas of legislative endeavor, where traditional areas of common law concern, expropriation, for example, arise. Substantive presumptions apply in limited and defined ways, consistent with the text as the medium of interpretation. They operate within the semantic meaning of the text as a soft constraint, as does purpose. Put differently, courts only consult substantive presumptions if the text invites it through the enactment of provisions that invite the exercise of judicial power. At their strongest, purpose as medium perspectives support a broader judicial role that seeks transubstantive coherence in most or all cases. This is a substantively different interpretive strategy one that is dissimilar in kind from the acceptance of defined and long-standing substantive presumptions, be legislative design choices and value compromises. As noted above, one of the restraints associated with the ideal of parliamentary sovereignty is that the output of the process, a statute written as a text, is owed special weight because it is the product of the constitutionally sanctioned institutional lawmaking process. A purposeless medium approach lacks a sufficient answer for what might be called the very essence of legislative choice. D. Deciding what competing values will or will not be sacrificed to the achievement of a particular objective 131 when legislatures promulgate laws, they trade, of competing interests, how to achieve legislative goals, alongside a choice of ends. 132 The choice of means is constitutive of the choice of ends in that the former qualifies or extends the latter. These choices, usually designed by the executive and adjusted through legislative processes, are quintessentially political in nature. Russ's distinction between local and global coherence is a good device to flesh out how purposeless medium interpretation can gloss over these legitimate legislative choices. Purposeless medium interpretation will tend to abstract away from the text, Sourcing purpose from judicial reasoning about the place of the statute in the broader legal order. This is because purpose as medium interpretation views legislative intent as a normative construct of the judiciary, not an empirical fact best represented by legislative language. This is a shift in focus from understanding how the legislature expressed its intention to how the statutory text should best be understood considering the abstract aim, perhaps represented in legislative history or otherwise. 133. The purpose as medium approach implicitly involves the use of a problematic counterfactual assumption of legislative intent to create a convincing account of the legislature's intention. The interpreter must maintain that the legislature intended to incorporate certain principles of the common law, political morality, or otherwise. One way to demonstrate this is through the device of counterfactual intention. Aristotle deployed this device. 134 and it is also found in Plowden's explanation of the equity of the statute approach. 135 as well as in modern methodologies of imaginative reconstruction. 136 Plowden says, it is a good way, when you peruse a statute, to suppose that the lawmaker is present, and that you have asked him the question you want to know touching the equity, then you must give yourself such an answer as you imagine he would have done, if he had been present. 137. This is a form of counterfactual reasoning that must underlie the purpose as medium view, because purpose cannot be directly sourced from text, it must be inferred from some other source. Sometimes purpose is inferred from legislative history, as in Roger's opinion in Shrink, but the Supreme Court has strongly cautioned against the regular use of legislative history, and traditional English practice rejects it. 138 instead, seeking coherence in the legal order, and preferring abstract aims of animating purpose, the interpreter in this mold must proceed by presumption, asking how the legislature, presuming certain qualities, would have adjudicated and decided the case in front of it, with this purpose or value in mind. Despite the vintage of the argument, counterfactual reasoning has been traditionally seen as suspect by logic and argumentation theory because, 
C. Artifactual conditionals resist any standard truth. Functional analysis that tries to reduce them to material conditionals 139 put differently. Counterfactuals are suspect because there is no fact of the matter as to their truth or falsity, or, if there is a fact of the matter, it is inaccessible to us 140. Why is the fact of the matter important? As Duxbury says, if intention is relevant in statutory interpretation, the only intentions that matter are those actually attributable to the enacting legislature, 141. Those who seek to understand the meaning of the law promulgated at the time of enactment must generally understand the text and the reasons that moved the legislature to adopt the law in question. This view characterizes s. interpretation using the intentions of actual authors 142. This is not necessarily so for those who take purpose as the essence of the legislative act to make the counterfactual work. This view must create a plausible alternative world that is identical to the actual world, but with conditions that warrant that the legislature desires coherence with certain abstract purposes. This view necessarily requires several value-laden judicial choices, i. Definition of the proper counterfactual question, 2. Which attributes or states of mind to grant the hypothetical legislators that adopted the law, 3. Whether... As a matter of doctrine, it is a reasonable legislature, or the actual legislature that adopted the law that should be consulted in the judicial assessment of the counterfactual, 143 for example, to ask the question how would the legislature have understood this specific case in light of its purposes, requires determining hypothetical intentions of, postulated, or fictitious, authors 144. This requires stipulation as to the conditions that the ideal legal author would have to meet to answer this question. 145. Depending on the normative theory that purportedly guides legislation, an interpreter must assign a graduating series of presumptions to the legislative act to describe the conditions of an ideal, stipulated author. The risk, however, is that these presumptions may create a divergence between the judicial construct of legislative intent and the legislation itself. Put differently, assumptions of legislative coherence may give the legislature or too much credit. Credit it may have never sought in the first place. As Stolter argues, fakeness in the operation of counterfactuals suggests that interpretation must be constructive. In some sense 146 the piling on of conditions that the legislature is just good or coherent requires assumptions that may not obtain in the actual world which hardly guarantees identification of the actual purposes behind a statute. 147. We can return to the Dworkinian position for an example. As we have seen, Dworkin's law's empire proceeds on the understanding that interpretation is a constructive endeavor in which purpose is imposed on a legal text. 148. Similarly, Vermeule's common good constitutionalism could fit in the Dworkinian mold. 149. But in more recent work, Vermeul also justifies his methodology through an appeal to several presumptions of legislative action, fighting the temptation of constructivism. Judicial assessment of the common good is sharply limited and structured in at least three ways. First, it is primarily a subconstitutional interpretive tool, which reads and interprets legislative texts by means of a series of structured presumptions that assume legislative rationality incorporation of higher sources of law into the civil positive law, an orientation to the common good that read legislation, in other words, within the horizon of the principles of legal justice that constitute IUS, including an orientation to the common good as a key element of IUS. 150. Unlike substantive canons of construction that are, as I noted above, doctrinally limited, the presumptions listed by Vermeule are assumptions about how the act of legislation connects to the broader legal order, but note the substantive birth of these presumptions. They presume that legislatures, when they enact law, also enact the higher sources of law that are not attributable to the positive hierarchy of laws of the jurisdiction, but rather to notions of reason and justice, reminiscent of the equity of the statute approach. To say that this higher law is the law only begs the question. As judicial presumptions are added on top of one another, the claim that the legislature's intention is faithfully reflected in the act of interpretation becomes difficult to sustain. The legislative act is constrained under the pressure of judicial presumption. This approach offers little account of how legislation, 
usually initially developed by the executive in Westminster parliamentary democracies, necessarily encompasses competing and often conflicting purposes. Indeed, the Supreme Court has accepted that legislatures do not pursue their purposes at all costs. 151 This reveals a certain understanding of what legislative action entails. Viewing legislation as simply declaratory of legal principle tells and interpret a little about how the legislature wanted to achieve its goals, a choice that ultimately compromises the achievement of higher order objectives. This view presents a more nuanced account of purposive action, a more complex and realistic account of legislative design, created by imperfect humans pursuing varied interests. The result, as Judge Easterbrook points out, is that, s. Tattoos do more than point in a direction, such as more safety. They achieve a particular amount of that objective, at a particular cost in other interests 152. He has described legislation as a complex set of design choices that indicate how and to what extent a legislature wishes to achieve its goals. Different designs pull in different directions. To use an algebraic metaphor, law is like a vector. It has length as well as direction. We must find both or we know nothing of value. To find length we must take account of objectives, of means chosen, and of stopping places identified. 153. This insight is important especially in cases where statutes appear to pursue goals that are broadly ameliorative, and seem deeply enmeshed with other values or norms, claim to carry legal power. In Schrenk and Walsh, the claimed values were, not without coincidence, placed at a level of generality that called to mind constitutional protection. The slide from a broadly stated statutory purpose to the claim of binding law is short. Perhaps in recognition of this temptation, the Supreme Court has insisted that defining a purpose too generally might prevent the discovery of what the legislature intended in its textual expression. 154. This means that an interpretive method that convincingly links to parliamentary sovereignty necessarily requires attention to the means 155, or secondary purposes, 156, disclosed in the text itself. To assist with this task, and in recent cases, the Supreme Court has identified the notion of institutional design choices, which are very technical choices that legislatures make about how a statute will operate. 157A choice to delegate power to an administrative decision maker is an institutional design choice, as is the grant of authority circumscribing, within constitutional limits, the jurisdiction of particular courts. These choices affect the legislature's overall aims. Sullivan helpfully notes that these institutional design choices, programmatic elaborations of the legislature's purposes, are expressed in the text. In words of restriction, qualification, or exception that limit the reach or effectiveness of the main goals, in provisions that confer discretion on officials, permitting them to respond to a range of factors, in the choice of program design and enforcement mechanism, which may be more, or less, comprehensive and efficacious. 158. In each case, these legislative design choices tell an interpreter something important about how a legislature wanted to accomplish its goals. Conditioning comprehensiveness of program design, narrow casting definitions to prevent semantic drift, or conferring discretion on administrative officials are all legitimate legislative choices that will affect how it wished to accomplish more abstract goals. By making these design choices, Legislatures implicitly make value-laden selections about which aims to sacrifice, and to what extent. This was the implicit view underlying McLaughlin CJC's view in Schrenk. The term regarding employment was related to the employment relationship, understood to reflect the economic concerns related to that relationship. This was the import of the legislature's design choice to attach particular regulatory consequences for a relationship characterized by a contract of employment. Nonetheless, this view is connected to the broad goals of the statute. On the other hand, Abella J's view does not see the term regarding employment as exhaustive of the legislative intent. Rather, the broad principles of human rights law are the starting points, and the question is whether a particular interpretation better promotes this purpose. This view gives no special meaning to the term employment, which is a particular legislative choice to adopt a precise term incapable of evolution or judicial extension. Further, 
This aim at abstract substantive coherence might distort the institutional procedures that facilitate the democratic will, replacing the legislative work product. This is a reason to put aside a mode of reasoning that seeks a tighter connection between ordinary meaning and statutory purpose as a matter of course. As Rouse says, this view might idealize the law out of the concreteness of politics 159. This is a problem because in countries with decent constitutions, the untidiness of politics is morally sanctioned 160. On this view, legislation is the product of imperfect processes of give and take, including the process of executive policy development, committee consideration, opposition attack, media scrutiny and adoption of these proposals by a legislature, 161 even before a legislature acts, executive proposals by their nature will pick certain options over others, necessarily compromising certain interests against others. This is the nature of government. In the Westminster tradition, an uh, as a matter of daily reality, ministers and party whips have to negotiate and compromise in order to secure the passage of the legislation, which the government has promoted, often in an amended form, 162 given this reality, we should expect legislatures to split the difference on the length and distance of the law when it adopts these value compromises as law. As Waldron argues, this plurality and even incoherence is the elementary circumstance of modern politics. 163 the adoption of and compromise between multiple objectives is a commonplace feature of modern statutes. 164 None of this denies that legislation is, at least in Canada, an intentional act of lawmaking. This is why it must be respected as an instantiation of parliamentary sovereignty. Indeed, this close attention to legislation is not gimletide literalism, nor is it substantively valueless. Attention to institutional design choices, disclosed through structural textual analysis, is an ideal way to discover the relationship between the how and why. The rational connection between means and ends that characterizes the legislative act, reflective of the pluralism of the process of policy development. This is particularly resonant in Walsh. There, Miller J. A. suggests that the legislature chose to achieve its more abstract goal by supplying a semantically narrow term that would always imply a necessary condition of reproducibility. By prohibiting transmissions of recordings, the legislature is nonetheless protecting the privacy and human dignity of those who are illicitly recorded, but rather than selecting a broad prohibition that captures all possible visual displays, it has made a different selection. It has chosen the rule of criminal liability that attaches only to reproductions, perhaps respecting different values of lenity. Put this way, this legislative choice still connects to the purposes of privacy and human dignity. But the legislature does not achieve those purposes at the cost of all other considerations, including second-order concerns about the design of rules, but also first-order, substantive choices about the scope of criminal liability. Failing to recognize this choice means trading implicit legislative value judgments for judicial ones, 165 absent some compelling reason to believe otherwise. Judicial insistence on coherence with an overarching purpose might displace a great deal of legislative policy making. 166 This, again, is because of the centrality of design choice to the legislative act. Where the legislature has spoken, for example, in the form of general statutory rules, which will inevitably fail to map on two pristine background principles, changing the scope of those rules to take account of a specific case would change the law itself, 167 This judicial amendment expands the scope of the law in much the same way Plowden, deploying the equity of the statute, advised, in situations where the law appears under-inclusive, reflection on the equity enacts all other things which are in the like degree. 168 Conclusion The two interpretive strategies I have identified are not necessarily separate categories. They have some commitments in common. They both identify purpose as an acceptable and always relevant aspect of interpretation. They both agree that legislative intent, of some kind, is a relevant organizing concept in the law of interpretation. However, they stake significantly distinct positions on important methodological and theoretical matters. In methodology, they differ on how the legislature best expresses its intention, to the degree such a thing exists. Substantively, 
They are informed by different appreciations of the value of coherence in a system of law. I have suggested that X does the best medium of legislative intention, offers the best account of the use of purpose in statutory interpretation. Legislation discloses means and ends, and it can trade off certain aims to achieve others. Statutes are the product of intentional legislative action in a pluralistic society. And for that reason, perfect global coherence between the act and legal principle cannot be guaranteed. Text as medium interpretation commits to the normative position that the act of interpretation should not attempt to guarantee this coherence. Doing so, on this account, trades away a key aspect of the legislature's choice. I have only been able to address methodological concerns, but as alluded to throughout, the methodological concerns foreground deep normative disagreements about the nature of law and the role of interpretation. If legislation is the product of intentional action in a pluralistic society, purpose as medium interpretation would redesign the balance struck in the legislative process between these groups. It seems especially urgent to clarify the role of this view of interpretation in a country like Canada where courts exercise significant legal authority. Copyright the author, S. 2024, published by Oxford University Press. Z. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution, and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited. Mark P. Mancini, Two Uses of Purpose in Statutory Interpretation, Statute Law Review, Volume 45, Issue 2, August, 2024, ME 040, HTTPS colon, slash slash, doi, dot org, slash 10, dot 1093, slash SLR, slash HMA 040.